Legendary King of Pop, Michael Jackson, passed away on Thursday. Michael Jackson died June 25th, 2009 from a drug overdose. The district attorney has charged Dr. Conrad Murray with involuntary manslaughter. Guilty. Dr. Conrad Murray was held solely responsible for Michael's death. The court imposes the high term of four years imprisonment in this case. Now, the lead detective in the case says Dr. Murray was just the last doctor of many left holding the bag. There's a lot of folks who are to blame that have never had a reckoning. Doctors like Arnold Klein, who regularly plied Michael with powerful opioids. Massive doses of Demerol were utilized for something that generally doesn't require anything other than maybe a topical anesthetic. Michael's ex-wife, Debbie Rowe, worked for Dr. Klein for years and says her ex-boss was a real-life Dr. Feelgood. There's a number of people that have died from their addictions, and in some way I was part of it. Give me a minute. Turns out Klein was just one of many doctors who put Michael on a fatal path. All of these different medical professionals that allowed Michael to get the medicines he wanted, all of them are the reason why he's dead today. I've taken a lot of blame that was not right, but regardless, I will always love Michael. Who really killed Michael Jackson? It's my profession. as soon as possible, sir. We have a, a gentleman here that needs help and he's not breathing. We're trying to pump him, but he's not. He's okay. Not. We quickly learned from a couple of sources that he went into cardiac arrest. He was rushed to UCLA Medical Center. So we started getting word from our sources that Michael Jackson was dead, dead at the house. So it was really weird that they still rushed him down to UCLA Medical Center. And it was just after two in the afternoon that we posted the story, Michael Jackson had died. TMZ broke the story of his transfer to the hospital this afternoon. The reports we are hearing from TMZ that the era of the King of Pop is over. TMZ was the first to report this, that Michael Jackson had died. My brother, the legendary King of Pop, Michael Jackson, passed away on Thursday, June 25th. Drug enforcement agents, Las Vegas and Los Angeles police officers raided the Las Vegas home of Dr. Conrad Murray. A law enforcement source tells CBS News the investigation is centered around the powerful anesthetic propofol. The district attorney has charged Dr. Conrad Murray with involuntary manslaughter in the pop star's death. The coroner ruled Jackson's death a homicide. We. The jury in the above entitled action find the defendant, Conrad Robert Murray, guilty of the crime of involuntary manslaughter. Dr. Conrad Murray may have been the final straw, but it was a straw that broke the camel's back. This was decades in the making. The reality is a bunch of doctors got Michael addicted, kept him addicted, connived with him to keep him strung out. And the fact is his death it was almost inevitable. It's a lot more complicated than just Dr. Murray was at his bedside when he died. Circumstances had been leading up to this death for years. And all of these different medical professionals that allowed Michael to dictate his own terms, get the medicines he wanted, when he wanted them, where he wanted them, all of them are the reason why he's dead today. Martinez. 
I am a detective with the Los Angeles Police Department, Robbery Homicide Division. I was one of the lead investigators in the Michael Jackson death investigation case. I'd been a police officer for 27 and a half years. At first, it was just the death investigation. It was, we thought it was natural causes. When I went to the house, nothing was really setting off alarm bells. As soon as I got into the room where he was being treated or, or being cared for, that's when my spidey sensor, my, my experience told me something is different here. So from the start, we had heard that Michael was being fueled with drugs. Frankly, we knew this because he was going to a Beverly Hills dermatologist named Arnold Klein just about every day in the two months leading up to his death. And he would go in there for about three to four hours and when he came out, it was absolutely bizarre. We had these videos of him interacting with fans and paparazzi, and he looked like a zombie. Yeah, the day after Jackson's death, the coroner went to the house, and that was the first time we heard about propofol. My name is Ed Winter. I was the assistant chief for the Los Angeles County Department of Coroner. I was there just under 17 years. I oversaw the high-profile cases, and I was called out the day that Michael Jackson was found unresponsive, was transported to the hospital, and passed away. We were able to recover large I describe it almost as Gatorade-sized bottles of propofol in the residence. I'm Dr. Drew Pinsky. I'm a board-certified internist and addiction medicine specialist. I'm a fellow with the American College of Physicians. I was the program medical director for a chemical dependency unit at Los Encinas Hospital. Let me be clear. Propofol is not a sleep medication. It's an anesthetic. You are completely shut down while you're on that medication. You are not going through normal sleep cycles, restorative sleep. You are on a profound anesthetic. The fact that <laughs> that was stored and administered in a private residence, not specifically in a hospital or surgical center, can't, can't imagine how that happened. <laughs> place called the Pied Pharmacy Services, which was in Las Vegas. Over the course of uh, April, May, and June, they shipped over four gallons worth of propofol to Dr. Murray's girlfriend's house for him to use to help keep Michael Jackson asleep every single night. I mean, it's, it's amazing that Mr. Jackson had passed away sooner. Dr. Murray told cops propofol was nothing new in Michael's life. One of the things that Dr. Murray told us was that Michael had an affinity for the propofol, which he called milk, because it looks like it's a white liquid, and that Michael had been using it to help him get rest and get sleep for years since he had discovered it in Europe. Dr. Murray said that he had a couple of doctors in Europe that would travel with him and provide him this drug to, to help him sleep. Dr. Murray took over from a doctor who had taken over from other doctors, basically allowing Mr. Jackson to dictate his own treatment, to use the drug that he preferred to help him get his rest. You feel like you've been unjustly accused with Michael Jackson? Because a lot of people feel like you're not guilty. Dr. Murray felt that if he did not help and administer it to Mr. Jackson that Michael would just go somewhere else to get it. Uh, he, he needed it. He knew about the drug, he knew that it worked for him and was the one who suggested it to Dr. Murray, actually demanded it. It was in the last couple of months you were contacted, right, initially by Amir and for this tour. Two months. In the last couple of months. Two months. Okay, you've administered it more than 10 times. Yes. More than 20 times. 30 days a month, roughly, every day. Oh, oh so it's about the daily. Uh, but daily, with the exception of three days leading up to his death, I tried to wean him off okay. that medication. The criminalist who advised me that the toxicology was showing a extremely large amount of propofol in Michael's system and that in his words he said there was enough propofol in him to put down a 
rhinoceros. Michael Jackson died of acute propofol intoxication and I believe cardiac arrest. I am Conrad Murray, a subspecialist in cardiology. I was Michael's personal physician at the latter part of his life. <laughs> The trial was clearly unjust. We first could not call any witnesses that we were interested in, many of whom were doctors that had treated Michael for years and years, decades, with opioids. I never did that. One of the spokes in Michael Jackson's wheel was a Beverly Hills doctor by the name of Dr. Arnold Klein. We will not be able to call Dr. Klein as a witness or his staff. I never enabled his addiction, which I was not aware of. Your Honor, I am an innocent man. They accused me of having Michael on a three-hour propofol infusion. That was false. We had no doubt. That's why we're here. Michael was watching over us. Yeah, he sure was watching over us. The judge denied Murray bail and sent him straight to jail. The judge is really throwing the book at him. The court imposes the high term of four years imprisonment in this case. I stayed in, in the Los Angeles jail for two years. I lived in a seven by five feet cell. It was a shattering experience. I was both mostly decimated with grief and, and pain. I lost just about most of what I had set up for my retirement, for my children's future, for a home, my livelihood. Michael's downward spiral all started when he filmed a Pepsi commercial in 1984. He was on stage as the director called for pyrotechnics to go off all around him. They did take after take after take. Finally, on take six, they pushed a little too hard and Michael ended up in harm's way. The pyrotechnics went off and the flames were licking right at Michael's hair, caught on fire. was a horrific scene. Singer Michael Jackson is back home tonight after suffering burns to his head last night during the filming of a Pepsi TV commercial. Jackson was dismissed from the hospital today against the advice of his doctor. He has uh, both second and third degree burns of the scalp. Fortunately, the third degree a component is relatively small. Michael's injuries were horrendous. Doctors used balloons to stretch his skin, and honestly, he never fully recovered, and that's when he got hooked on painkillers. Keep in mind, this is 1984, a full quarter century before he died, and he became profoundly addicted to pain meds. It is completely appropriate for Michael Jackson to receive opiates for a burn. He shouldn't suffer. He should get the necessary pain medication. But to go for months or even years afterwards on opioid pain medications is ridiculous. And there was an excessive enthusiasm in my profession for the prescribing of opiates. I attempted to give him a shot at Demerol, but his buttocks was um, so scarred up and abscessed that the needle almost bent. He was quite familiar with the product and felt that there was no fear of it. Different doctors had given it to him from all around the world, including Germany, and they allowed him to sometime inject the medicine. He was able to push the propofol himself, and the doctors allowed him to do it, and that was okay. So there's a vicious cycle going on here. The more Michael Jackson recorded hits, 
the more he toured and the worse his addiction became. For example, he recorded Thriller. That became the biggest selling album of all time and that created an insatiable appetite on the part of his fans to want to see him in concert. He made a big dash through the world. This was the scene last night as people arrived plenty early for the long-awaited, sold-out Michael Jackson concert. Michael! 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 I love Michael Jackson! Yeah. Jackson. I love him so much! And there was also the Victory Tour, which was the farewell tour for the Jackson 5. And Michael didn't even want to do that tour. When I do those solo albums and I'm doing all kinds of different music, it's wonderful. I feel like I'm accomplishing what I'm supposed to do. And you don't feel guilty or worried about your brothers? No. But there was so much family pressure. His mom eventually convinced him to do it, and that just made a bad addiction worse. It happened about an hour ago in Kansas City, the start of what's being billed as the biggest traveling musical show in American history. Some people say that it's more like what happened 20 years ago when the Beatles first played Kansas City. But most of Michael Jackson's fans are too young to remember that. For them, this is the biggest moment in their lives. And that was followed by the bad tour. 16 months of grueling performing and traveling. And by the time the dangerous tour hit, Michael was a mess. When I look at somebody like Michael, I've seen him, the lights have gone out on stage, and he's fallen to the floor in the darkness. Somebody comes out, gives him oxygen, the lights come up, and he's right back ready to hit it. He was said to be taking oxygen backstage after every second prompt. He started canceling tour dates for various illnesses before he just pulled the plug on the entire tour. Jackson canceled a Friday show in Caracas, Venezuela, and shows scheduled for Sunday and Tuesday in Puerto Rico, and all future dates on the dangerous tour. So here's what was going on behind the scenes. Michael graduated from pain meds to anesthesia. He used it to sleep, and he became shockingly reliant on it. A lot of people were saying privately, Michael's addictions and the cancellation of the dangerous tour were directly connected. I attempted to give him a shot of Demerol, but his buttocks was um, so scarred up and abscessed that the needle almost bent, <laughs> in which case at that point in time I ran an IV and I administered some IV pain medication. And do you recall what IV pain medication you administered? Morphine. Michael was on the Dangerous Tour in 1993 in Bangkok, and that's when he asked Dr. Finkelstein to shoot him up with Demerol. After um, I took care of Mr. Jackson, and he went on stage, another doctor from uh, England came and assumed responsibility for Mr. Jackson. I came back from a trip to the pyramids and my suitcase of which I had all my medications in was uh, broken into. Uh, at that time, the doctor uh, you know, told me what, that he had broken into my suitcase to get medications. What specific medication did you break in your suitcase to get? The pain meds. I don't recall if it was Demerol or morphine or both. And did he break in to get the pain medication to give it to Mr. Jackson? Yes. We felt that we needed to do an intervention. We needed to be detoxed. They called in Elizabeth Taylor to do an inter intervention. When Michael's doctor called to ask if I could help, I was glad to intervene. I traveled to Mexico City where I saw for myself that Michael was in desperate need of specialized medical attention. Because of my own experience with addiction to prescription medicines, I was able to make a number of calls in search of the best and most appropriate treatment for Michael. And he is now undergoing such treatment in Europe. Michael was in such bad shape, he knew he needed help. Superstar recording artist Michael Jackson says he is canceling the rest of his world concert tour because he's addicted to painkillers. Superstar Michael Jackson is now in a drug clinic somewhere. As you may already know, after my tour ended, I remain out of the country undergoing treatment for a dependency on pain medication. This medication was initially prescribed to see the excruciating pain that I was suffering after recent reconstructive surgery on my scalp. I became increasingly more dependent on the painkillers 
to get me through the days of my tour. My friends and doctors advised me to seek professional guidance immediately in order to eliminate what has become an addiction. It is time for me to acknowledge my need for treatment in order to regain my health. It was really only after this we could see the pattern. The overwork, the cancellations. In hindsight, it was so clear. All these pills were from doctors. He got heavy duty, very, very strong painkillers, and he took them, unfortunately. He was barely able to function adequately on an intellectual level. You okay, Mr. Jackson? You want to take a break? My mouth hurts. Okay. Mr. Jackson, with the break, did you find it necessary to take a, a pain medication? Do I find it necessary? Did you, at the break, did, did, did you have to take a pain medication for your yes. pain? Painkillers were one thing, but Michael had even bigger problems. He couldn't sleep, especially when he was on tour or getting ready for tour. So he went to doctors for help, and it turns out Conrad Murray was late to the game. Conrad. When I'm on this course, when I'm on, 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 the, on the tour, I have difficulty sleeping. And what most doctors have done for me, they helped me to sleep for 15 to 18 hours. Michael was using Propofol to sleep. He had mentioned that that was the only way he could go to sleep, especially when he was getting ready for a tour. I'm always writing potpourri of music. I never stopped. He was quite familiar with the product and felt that there was no fear of it. You know, it was not a big deal. He had been using it for decades. Uh, and different doctors had given it to him from all around the world, including Germany. And they allowed him to sometimes inject the medicine. He was able to push the propofol himself. And the doctors allowed him to do it. And that was okay. Klein's attorney told me that he would come in for injections for an acne treatment and that was quite strange because I don't know anybody that goes in for a three to four hour acne treatment. When I heard Michael Jackson died, I immediately thought of him going out to his dermatologist on a regular basis for some sort of treatment. I knew it was opiates and I knew that was the primary issue. We were getting videos daily of him going to Dr. Arnie Klein's office. He looked totally normal going in, three or four hours would go by and he would come out looking completely out of it. Love you, Michael. Okay. Okay. The day Michael died, he spent hours begging, begging to fall asleep, begging for propofol. He kept saying that he had to sleep, his shoe was going to fall apart, he needed to sleep. Michael was desperate, and Murray told detectives that he simply gave in. I then decided to go ahead and give him some of the medicine so he could get a couple of hours of sleep so that he could produce, because I cared about him. I didn't want him to fail. Hey, you told you got cancer, Mike. When are you going to have it, Mike? At the time all this was going on, Michael was going to see Dr. Arnie Klein, the famous Beverly Hills dermatologist. Klein, who died back in 2015, was known as the dermatologist to the stars. All these famous people like Elizabeth Taylor, Carrie Fisher, and so many others went to him for skin treatments. And Michael did as well. And the two became not just close, but best friends. Klein essentially became Michael's Dr. Feelgood. because you have to understand that the procedure I do are painful injections. And I would give him, I would say I would take an hour and a half to inject him, and I would do somewhere around, oh, well over 100 facial injections on him. I'm Dr. Harry Glassman, I'm a plastic surgeon. I've been in private practice of plastic surgery in Beverly Hills for the past 45 years. Massive doses of Demerol were utilized for something that generally doesn't require anything other than maybe a topical anesthetic. Let me be as clear as I can be. Demerol is not a sedative. It can make you drowsy, 
It is not a sedative. It is an opiate medication. But the, the goal of medication like Demerol is pain control. How's it going, Michael? Are you going on tour? In London, huh? What about the Jackson 5? You going to tour Jackson 5? Yeah. Oh, you are? Michael's routine was to go to Dr. Klein's office and get high on Demerol for hours at a time. Dr. Klein was more than happy to oblige, and he justified it with minor procedures, acne treatments, Botox, Restylane, and he did this over and over and over again. Oh, look at the jacket, Michael. That's so cool. I don't know anybody that goes in for a three to four hour acne treatment. When I heard Michael Jackson died, I immediately thought of him going out to his dermatologist on a regular basis for some sort of treatment. I knew it was opiates, and I knew that was the primary issue. The propofol was just the final event. And here's where the plot thickens. Klein was always at the ready for Michael, and MJ never had to look too far to find him. They went on vacations together, they spent Christmas together, they would go to events together. It's pretty clear that each was getting what they wanted out of this relationship. There is in uh, the relationship between the doctor and the celebrity patient something that sort of becomes a quid pro quo. I'll do this for you. In Arnie's case, he was traveling with Michael, he was on vacation with Michael, and you'll do this for me. Obviously, in this case, narcotics or even heavy sedation. He was getting propofol in Germany. That's the most recent tour. And that was being arranged, I'm not gonna mention the doctor, by another doctor in Los Angeles. And I told the doctor, I mean, I, you know, I just thought this is totally insane. This doctor's arranging German doctors to give Michael propofol. It's like giving someone the drug they want. I was able to interview his uh, wife, Debbie Rowe. She said that Dr. Klein accompanied him when he was in Germany and he couldn't prescribe medicines or medication there, but hooked up with a doctor or two in Germany to get drugs for Michael. So fast forward to three months before Michael's death. We were getting videos daily of him going to Dr. Arnie Klein's office. He looked totally normal going in. Three or four hours would go by and he would come out looking completely out of it. Hey, Michael. Hey Michael. Michael, how are you? Good. Oh, Michael, Simon, operation. Michael, I'll just and make a pathway, guys. Make a pathway. Make a pathway. Make a pathway. Okay. Hey, Michael, get a room, guys. Get a room. Get a room, guys. Get a room, guys. Michael, 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 you're the best. Michael, 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 Yes. On many occasions? Yes. Estimate for us how many times a week you would you would do that. It could fluctuate. Uh, there were times when he was going almost every day. Michael became a regular, and he was going to Klein's office almost every day and getting Demerol injections. At least 51 injections within the three months before he died. And these weren't small doses. 300 milligrams a pop. Oh no, that's that's absurd. There's a categorically no justification for massive doses of opiates for simple dermatologic procedures. Not only that, he was using Demerol 300 milligrams at a time. 300 milligrams of Demerol is enough to knock out a horse. I had no idea of Michael's uh, history of his health and doctors who were treating him. He never ever mentioned anything of drug addiction to me. What I used drugs for was not to give him drugs. I mean, he used drugs to relieve the pain when I did a procedure. So we have to make a big difference. If you're having a surgical procedure, and these are really minor surgical procedures, and with my length of time it takes me to do it, it's not minor, you have to use some amount of, of drug. For Michael to have been going almost daily for injections of his acne or injections of Restylane or, or, or Botox, it kind of doesn't add up for me. How are you? Come on, guys. How are you, Michael? Hey, you're doing great. You don't go and have Restylane on Monday, more Restylane on Tuesday, more Restylane on, on Wednesday. The only thing that makes any sense to me is that he was there for the drugs, not for the Botox or fillers or acne. Dr. Waldman, have you formed an opinion about whether or not Michael Jackson was dependent on Demerol? Yes, I believe there is evidence that he was dependent upon Demerol. Six weeks of very frequent high dose use, I believe, would result in, in opioid dependence in any of us. Hey, Michael, 
Dr. Klein would have him go up to this gynecologist's office and Dr. Klein would go, go give him his shot or do whatever he was going to do and then go back down to his office so Michael wasn't hanging out at his office for two or three hours. I honestly don't believe that Michael Jackson got 51 shots of Demerol from Arnie Klein. I would guess it probably two or three times that. I'm Kerry Anderson, and uh, prior to working with Michael Jackson as the director of security, uh, I worked LAPD for several years. I worked narcotics. I was considered a court qualified narcotics expert. I dealt with uh, Arnold Klein a couple of times. Michael had me go down and pick him up once and bring him to Neverland. I walked Dr. Klein probably 20 feet from the courtyard area inside Michael's main residence. I walked him upstairs to Michael's room. Michael had requested get Dr. Klein something uh, to drink. So I went back downstairs and uh, myself and another uh, personnel in the house, and we weren't gone any more than, I would say, four minutes at the most. And by the time I got back up, Michael was so out of it. So whatever he gave him, I, I've never seen a, a narcotic do somebody like that so quick because M Michael was perfectly normal when I went upstairs and in a four minute period, he, he was almost a zombie. So it must have been some kind of injection of something. And uh, at times you'd want to put hands on people like that. I, I, I don't have a lot of good things to say about people like that. I, he's disgusting to me. Arnie Klein shot Michael up at Demerol for a price, a pretty hefty one. He was charging him thousands and thousands of dollars just for a weekend visit. Money's not my object in life. My object is to be the best doctor. I mean, I gotta be honest, I never asked him for a nickel. Now, you say my bill was a lot, and I have to tell you about my bill. My bill was, you know, I used to spend three days with him. You know, I used to fly back and forth with, on helicopters when he called me. Right. So, I mean, when you put all that money together, flying around on helicopters all the time to see him, and spending three days with him at a time, your days over three days is worth a lot of money. You were friends with him and you were best friends with him and you were also his doctor. And I asked you if there's a danger of blurring the line and if you could go back 20 years, would you elect to treat Michael Jackson as a patient? I don't have many friends, you know that. My friends are my patients. My patients are my patients 24 hours a day. You know, they call me three o'clock in the morning. They call me four o'clock in the morning. You know, I've flown as far as Tokyo to see a patient. I've flown to the Middle East to see a patient where Jews shouldn't go. So I'm telling you, when you say what I do is medicine, the practice of medicine, I mean, I'm not a shrink. I'm not, you know, Freud. But I think that you do blur the lines because you're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's exploitative to some extent for a doctor also to be their friend. You're there to be their doctor and that's that. Be that and that's it. If you want to be their friend, go be their friend. That's fine. But you can't also be their doctor. The fact is, if you slip from a physician to friend, that's on you. That, that's a problem. You, you've crossed a boundary at that point. My name is Debbie Rowe. And I worked with Dr. Arnold Klein for 27 years. There's a number of people that have died from their addictions. And in some way, I was part of it. Give me a minute. C1, take one, ABC mark.
My name is Debbie Rowe, and I worked with Dr. Arm Klein for 27 years and would assist him in the back with patients. I did everything from acne surgery to prescribing medications. It got a little better. Yeah. Right Dr. Where? Klein was a brilliant dermatologist. He could walk into the room, look at you, almost give you a family history of who you were and what diseases were in the family and stuff like that. When Dr. Klein started treating famous people, celebrities, um, powerful people, he started to be invited to their uh, parties and things like that. And I think it influenced some of the ways that he thought. And he enjoyed going to the parties. If he was having a get together or a party, they would all be invited. He enjoyed living that lifestyle. He did try very hard to be of the rich and famous. Anybody who sees uh, a particular group of patients that they are in awe of or enamored with will do almost anything to get another person of that caliber into the practice. It ends up being more of a friendship than it is a professional relationship. You pick who you hang with and he is a person that you want to hang with because you're going to be able to get something in return. There were times that he would write prescriptions for um, things that had nothing to do with what we were treating them for. You know, some people would come in and say they can't take the pain, so they would want a Percocet, or they would want Demerol, or they would want something else. I believe very firmly that you're only as good as the last patient you inject. So there might be someone, they were a big star. He would write prescriptions that were not conducive to what a dermatologist would normally write a prescription for. The primary responsibility of any doctor is the patient care. I mean, we take an oath to, above all else, do no harm. And giving someone massive doses of narcotics for an everyday trivial procedure is clearly a breach of the person's medical care. You don't give Xanax because someone says they can't sleep. You don't give them Demerol because they have pain that they either aren't monitoring, don't have anyone moderating it and watching it, or they just want it. They would ask Dr. Klein to write a prescription because they were having a party and a bunch of people were coming and they wanted to have party favors. We had some powerful patients that would come in and say, I'm, I need to get 90 Percocet for Saturday night. And then you go to the party that weekend and there's a candy dish with Percocet or Quaaludes or something like that. And it came from the office by trading drugs for the invitation, the inclusion. You know, he just wanted to be in that group. I don't know if he knew the person was an addict, but didn't care because he didn't want to lose that person as a patient, but it was done. And there were a lot of doctors out there with the same um, patients that would do the same thing. 
it's narcissism. It's gratifying to have a special person under your care and that person to then be satisfied and tell you you're a good doctor. And it helps pe build people's reputation. You become, particularly in the, the sort of field of plastics and dermatology and beauty, you become the doctor that's taking care of those people we see in the magazines. Sometimes patients had obvious signs of addiction, injection marks all over their body. I was mortified when I found out that patients were so addicted to something that you couldn't sedate them or whatever. You have to start an IV if you're gonna sedate someone. And not being able to find a vein to start an IV, there was no place to be able to do it. I do believe boundaries were down and lines were crossed that should not have been. Prescriptions were written that didn't need to be written. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It is such a violation of our basic responsibility and ethical standards as a physician to be treating people to make ourselves feel special. In other words, we are there to serve the patient. And if we are somehow excited by or turned on by the patients we are treating, there's already a problem. And then if you are handing out medication without proper justification, I, I, it just doesn't get worse than that. We went through two decades of my patients being killed routinely by my peers, and it was often in situations like this. I feel horrible about not trying to stop it with people that I knew had problems. And there's nothing I can do to take it back. And if someone was hurt by it, And saying I'm sorry isn't enough. To me, it's like I should have tried harder. I should have tried to stop it. I should have done more. I should have done something. And I didn't. And at the end, you're ultimately responsible for what you've done, how you participated. You have to take responsibility for it. There's a number of people that have died from their addictions. And in some way, I was part of it. Give me a minute. You know, it's hard when you feel like you're part of the problem and you don't stop. I just think I should have been a better person than I was. I sucked as a human being for years when I think about it. I was basically I was basically as bad as him, and I regret that. I will regret it. And I'm so sorry that I participated in it. If I had known that Michael was going to a dermatologist's office or any doctor, and being shot up or dripped up with opioids on a daily basis, there would be a two-step dance. One, he has a problem. Two, I take you to where you can be treated. And if you fail to do that, I am out. He's getting opioids during the day. He's withdrawing at night. So now we have somebody on continuous substances that are dangerous and inappropriate.
Michael had a lot of psychological problems. In addition to addiction, he suffered from body dysmorphia. He became a plastic surgery addict. He got his nose done, then he got it redone, then redone again. There's something called the body dysmorphic disorder. Has anyone here ever heard of that? Anyone here? Are there any women right here? Women? Any women here? See, all these people, if you walk down the street, are obsessed with the way they look, to the point where they distort themselves. And these are people who go after doctors and end up having faces after faces. They look tighter and tighter, so they don't look human anymore. And these are the people you really have to do with, these biased, morphic people. When you look in the mirror, are you happy with what you see? In, in what way? Just when you look there, in terms of that social philosophy. Um, I'm never totally satisfied. I always wish the world could be a better place. Um, no, not at all. Is it like on a scale where he was an extreme? Extremely, because but he really viewed his face as a work of art. You have to understand, it's hard to take to understand this, but he really looked at his face as a work of art, an ongoing work of art. Wait, was, was his about aging or was it about? It was, a, it was about pure beauty and he wanted people to see him and pee in his, their pants. That's what he told me. Michael came to see me quite a number of years before he passed away. He was referred to me by his dermatologist, Dr. Arnold Klein, and he was seeking uh, surgery on his nose. But his nose had been operated on many times before that. And so I did the courtesy of examining him and then advised him against having surgery for fear that one more procedure could conceivably compromise the blood supply to his nose. And so he was not very happy with me um, he tried to encourage me to change my mind, but my mind was fixed the moment he walked through the door. It was his addiction to opioids and anesthesia that really consumed him. So by day, Dr. Klein would shoot Michael up with Demerol, which by the way causes insomnia. By night, Dr. Murray would shoot him up with propofol. Michael Jackson never mentioned a single doctor to me who was treating him with opioids, propofol or any of those substances. He made it look as though I was his sole physician. Dr. Arnold Klein addicted Michael Jackson to Demerol. And he will tell you that one of the insidious effects, the most difficult things about Demerol addiction and its withdrawal is an inability to sleep. If I had known that Michael was going to a dermatologist's office or any doctor and being shut up or dripped up with opioids on a daily basis, there would be a two-step dance. One, he has a problem. Two, I take you to where you can be treated. And if you fail to do that, I am out. Michael's insomnia was drug withdrawal. Let's be clear about that. He was an opiate addict, benzodiazepine addict. Those patients always have insomnia. And he found an interesting solution to his drug withdrawal, which is a barbiturate. In this case, propofol, which treats the drug withdrawal insomnia. It does it very effectively. It doesn't treat the addiction. It makes the addiction worse, and it threatens his life. So he's getting opioids during the day. He's withdrawing at night. So now we have somebody on continuous substances that are are dangerous and inappropriate. It became known to me after Michael died that uh, he had been at various facilities throughout the community for, for relatively trivial matters and placed under either general anesthesia or, or uh, let's say sedation in, in order to do the sort of thing that you would do um, every day without any sort of medication or without anesthesia. There were a number of facilities and a number of different people involved. For more than two decades, Michael was using doctors to fuel his addiction. And if you think there's any way these doctors didn't know he was a hardcore drug addict who needed help, that's just impossible. Michael Jackson had dozens, dozens of injection marks all over his body. Right. All over his body. Dozens. Right. So yeah, he I mean, had a if, serious, if, serious drug problem. If that's Anyone who's gone to medical school and sees a patient with uh, multiple puncture sites in the veins of their arms and legs, I mean, it hits you over the head. I mean, this person is clearly an addict. 
doctors allowed him to use 19 different aliases for all these different medications, powerful medications, and with that, you cannot cross-check against each other because one doctor doesn't know what name another doctor has given, and that's enabling abuse. Michael Jackson was a drug addict, and he was a master at manipulation because I was manipulated by Michael. I did not enable him at any time in his addiction. I would never do that. Michael, how are you? We found out that Michael was using uh, aliases. I did uh, go to Dr. Arnold Klein's office and wanted to interview him and get a copy of his medical records and find out what was going on. When I got to the office, his office, uh, he supposedly was unavailable. Can you call me, sir? Can you call me, sir? Tell us what happened here today. Can you get the files you have looking for? We're still conducting our investigation. There is a security hold on the case. That's right. And I can't come in. So I went downstairs to the pharmacy and talked to the pharmacist, and the pharmacist gave me the whole list of what drugs he was taking and the aliases. I was shocked. I was shocked at, uh, that this was going on. The doctors allowed him to use 19 different aliases for all these different medications, powerful medications, and with that, you cannot cross-check against each other because one doctor doesn't know what name another doctor has given, and that's, that's, that's enabling abuse. The way that Michael went about getting all these drugs was doctor shopping. He had multiple different doctors that he was involved with, and you know he'd go to Doctor A and ask for a sedative, and then he'd go to Doctor B and may ask for the same one. And so by manipulating a series of different doctors, Michael accumulated an enormous amount of medication. What you're going to learn about Michael Jackson is that. He had the habit of compartmentalizing relationships, packaging relationships, like spokes in a wheel. The wheel in his life turned, but the people that he associated with, the, the groups of people, were like spokes. They rarely, if ever, touched. When I put it all together, what I've learned since then, during and before the trial, Michael Jackson was a drug addict. And he was a master at manipulation because I was manipulated by Michael. I did not enable him at any time in his addiction. I would never do that. I cared about Michael too much. I loved Michael. I haven't lost that love for Michael, despite the pain and suffering that I've encountered. There were what they call a drug book that every doctor has a, a book that he puts his patient's information in and supposed to list what medications they had. And uh, Dr. Klein actually had two books, one that just showed some miscellaneous medication and then another book that uh, listed his aliases and some of the other uh, medications he was getting. Through the investigation and in the trial, one of the things we found out there was a pharmacy in Beverly Hills called Mickey Fine that he owed in excess of $100,000. And that pharmacy was on the ground floor of Dr. Arnold Klein, the same doctor that was infusing him with opioids on a daily basis. After Michael's death, the extent of his drug use became evident. He had basically a pharmacy of prescription drugs, dangerous drugs, written by various doctors using Jackson's 19 aliases. And the list of prescriptions found at his home after he died, it was eye-popping. Such a variety of powerful meds, it baffled even the most seasoned of doctors. 
I don't even know what half of those drugs are. I mean, I looked at that list and I was amazed at how many drugs were found at the scene. The sheer number of prescriptions found at Michael's bedside when he died is just mind boggling. 22 different meds prescribed by at least four different doctors from four different pharmacies. And a lot of these prescriptions didn't even have the patient's name or the doctor's name in the label. The labels were just blank. It's insane. Propofol, lidocaine, diazepam, nordiazepam, uh, lorazepam, and midazolam. Opiates like Demerol, benzodiazepines like Ativan and Xanax, and the barbiturates like propofol, they eventually come together to suppress respirations. And people don't breathe, and then their heart stops. We're still looking for medical records involved, involving uh, Michael Jackson. Michael's addiction was much worse than the medical records that uh, we were able to obtain or see uh, were, were much greater that uh, we'll never know. It all comes back to the fact that Michael Jackson was one of the biggest stars on the entire planet and all these doctors like Klein who treated like Klein who treated him, they themselves became intoxicated. Celebrities uh, can manipulate doctors to get what they want, no question about that. And it's been uh, my experience that you have to be very resilient to their, to their seduction, such that you don't treat them any differently than you would a non-celebrity. Michael is responsible to a great extent for his own demise, but he certainly had a lot of help in the medical community. It's sad that uh... The doctors are caught up with the celebrity status and that uh, some of the celebrities are caught up, you know, wanting to keep that doctor close. Uh, you know, some of the drug addicts, they're best friends with the person they're buying their heroin from and they want to stay close to them. I don't think there's any question that Michael was a drug addict. I made two personal interventions on him, remember that. I got him off of drugs twice in my lifetime. So there was an ongoing problem with him in the use of drugs. Now, when you're rich and you're famous in America, you can get anything you want. Because I think what we have here is a lot of bad medicine. We have some good medicine, but I think we have a whole bunch of bad medicine. A lot of people who didn't care whether Michael lived or died, as long as they made money off of him. And I think that was the biggest thing that, that this whole story is about, that we've seen the loss of integrity in many fields. There's a lot of folks who are to blame that have never had a reckoning for his death. Ever since I was born, Daddy has been the best father you could ever imagine. And I just wanted to say I love him so much. So addiction is one thing, but there's another factor in Michael's death, a big factor. At the time Michael died, he was rehearsing for the This Is It tour, and there were alarm bells going off everywhere. Michael was strung out, too weak to perform, and the sad fact is, very few people around him were even listening. The record company you would like for you to support your album and go on tour, and uh, I don't like to. It's a difficult thing to tour. You go from one continent to another, you're sleepy, the time zones are different, you can't sleep after the show, the adrenaline is up here. Well, can we can we just do it again without the just the negative saying that you don't like the tour? Just I don't like it. Though. I know, but it, I go through but hell. What setting up though? I don't know. No, I go know, through hell the tour. Thing okay, then touring I, is I'll make it positive then. Yeah, it's just don't. Well, you know the truth. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and action, Michael. I love to tour. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to that. I'm going to read this again and see if you have an understanding of what it means. We want to remind him that it is AEG, not MJ, who is paying his salary. Based on the assumptions that AEG is your company and MJ is Michael Jackson, 
Do you have an understanding of what that means? No, I don't understand it because we weren't paying a salary. So why would you write that? I have no idea. When you say his salary, who are you talking about? I don't know. Oh. But how do you know you weren't paying his salary if you don't know who we're talking about? I don't remember this email. No, you, you just testified we weren't paying his salary. You just testified to that a few seconds ago. Right? I guess. wasn't well, but he needed the This Is It tour for a couple of reasons. He was deep in a financial hole and in danger of losing Neverland Ranch, his home. Also, after the molestation trial, he felt the need to gain the approval of his fans. He was sick, addicted, and desperate. I think all my success is fame, and I've wanted it. I wanted it. Because I wanted to be loved, that's so all. That's the real truth. I wanted people to love, truly love me, because I never really felt loved. I wanted to become such a wonderful performer that I would get love back. So Michael's family sued AEG, the production company behind the This Is It tour, claiming that it was responsible for Michael's death by hiring Conrad Murray and by pushing Michael too hard in the wake of all of his problems, including his addictions. These will be my final show performances in London. This is it, and see you in July. The family felt that AEG was more interested in making a fortune than protecting Michael's health. And the family's lawyers grilled AEG bigwigs in depositions. Was there a problem, Mr. Phillips, with Mr. Jackson's appearance at the press conference that day? Something unusual happened? Yeah, we were late. You sent an email to Mr. Lightwicky? Light yes. Do you recall receiving this email from Mr. Randy Phillips? No. And so this is dated March 5th, 2009. Uh, Mr. Phillips wrote to you, according to this exhibit. MJ is locked in his room, drunk and despondent. Tome and I are trying to sober him up and get him to the press conference with his hairdresser makeup artist. Do you see that? The bottom of the page? I read it. Okay. Do you know who he, was, who he was referring to with MJ? I, I didn't get, I don't remember this email. And then Mr. Lightwicky responds, are you kidding me? Correct. You responded to Mr. Phillips, are you kidding me? Do you see that? I see it. Do you recall what you meant by that? I, I don't remember this email. And then you responded with the longer entry there. Correct. And you wrote, I screamed at him so loud the walls are shaking. Yes, that was an, that was an exaggeration, but I did raise my voice. All right. And then Randy Phillips responded to you, this is the scariest thing I have ever seen. He is an emotionally paralyzed mess, riddled with self-loathing and doubt. Now that it is showtime, he is scared to death. Right now, I just want to get through this press conference. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Was that an exaggeration? It was And was it an exaggeration also that he is an emotionally paralyzed mess? That's what that's what I that's what I felt at the time. And according to this evidence, you responded, "Call me, please." I agree that it says that. Do you know why you asked Mr. Phillips to call you, please? I don't remember the email. The AEG execs were grilled over emails they sent. Emails that paint a picture of a company that was determined to get Michael on stage and ignore some of the problems that he was dealing with, including his addictions. When they were asked about these emails, these execs had lots of memory lapses. I'm gonna read this again and see if you have an understanding of what it means. We want to remind him that it is AEG, not MJ, who is paying his salary. Based on the assumptions that AEG is your company and MJ is Michael Jackson, do you have an understanding of what that means? No, I don't understand it because we weren't paying a salary. So why would you write that? I have no idea. When you say his salary, who are you talking about? 
I don't know. Oh. But how do you know you weren't paying his salary if you don't know who we're talking about? I don't remember this email. Um, didn't you just testify that we weren't paying his salary? AG? Yes. No, you, you just testified we weren't paying his salary. You just testified to that a few seconds ago. Right? I guess. Okay, let's go on to the next sentence. We want him to understand what is expected of him, period. Do you know what you meant there? No. It, is, there a, is there a word in that sentence that you don't understand? I don't understand the sentence. I'll read it again. We want him to understand what is expected of him. Does that help? No. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in place of him what I think it's supposed to be and see if that helps. We want Dr. Murray to understand what is expected of Dr. Murray. Does that help? No. Michael was incoherent at times, clearly because of drugs. There's audio of him after that London press conference, and it is bone chilling. Would you believe my show? I want to say, I have seen nothing like this in my life. Hey, Mike. What's up, man? Oh, no, man. Just... Wait, where's the yeah. car, Mike? Where's your car? I'm trying, I'm trying to get there. Is it? I don't know. The Jackson family believed that AEG ignored clear signs that Michael was in grave danger because AEG stood to make a fortune off the This Is It tour. Mr. Gondelware wrote, meanwhile, our play here is to not back off. We are holding all the risk. If MJ won't approve it, we go without his approval. You see that? Correct. And Paul recommended going ahead and with the press conference and putting the tickets on sale because one, once we go on sale, which we have the right to do, he is locked. He has no choice. He has to do it, right? Twenty one. Okay. Did you agree with that? No. Randy Phillips wrote, we need to pull the plug now, period. I will explain, period. Do you have an understanding of what Randy Phillips meant by that? I have no idea. Did, did you have an understanding that for some reason, on March 25th, 2009, Mr. Phillips thought that, that you needed to pull the plug on the tour? I don't recall that. Did something happen around this time, March of 2009, that was creating a concern for you and Mr. Phillips? Not that I recall. You sent an email to Dan Beckerman stating, trouble with MJ, big trouble, period. What are you guys up to tonight, period? I, I don't remember the specific email. Does this email indicate to you that you knew as of June 20th, 2009, there was some trouble going on with Michael Jackson? We were aware that he had missed several rehearsals. And you thought he was having a mental breakdown, didn't you? No. You didn't? No. Then why did you write to Dan Beckerman at 4.15 p.m. that same day, he is having a mental breakdown. I'm not sure I'm not referring to Randy. Oh, really? Was, I, I don't know specifically. Was, was Mr. Phillips having a mental breakdown? I don't know what I was referring to specifically, but it could have been to Randy. Mr. Kane uh, was Mr. Jackson's business manager eventually. Is that correct? That is correct. And he sends you an email on June 23, at 11.22, asking on the list of doctors that will help get up from today to the opening night. Where does Arnold Klein stand on the list? Correct. Probably up was us. Should have been us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. And your, what was your response? He scares us to death because he's shooting him up at something. Why did he scare you to death?
I use that terminology. Randy Phillips had good reason to be scared because Michael was incoherent at times, clearly because of drugs. There's audio of him after that London press conference, and it is bone chilling. <laughs> When people believe in this show, when people believe my show, I want to say, I've never seen something like this in my life. No, no, I've never seen anything like this. No, it is it, amazing. He is very in the world. Kenny Ortega, the producer of the This Is It tour, wrote a letter to AEG shortly before Michael's death. This is what he wrote. There are strong signs of paranoia, anxiety, and obsessive-like behavior. I think the very best thing we can do is get a top psychiatrist in to evaluate him ASAP. There's no one taking responsibility, caring for him on a daily basis. Today, I was feeding him, wrapping him in blankets, and calling his doctor. Can you describe what you personally observed on that day, June 19th, 2009. That my friend wasn't right, that he wasn't well, there was something going on that was deeply troubling me. And um, he appeared lost. What do you mean by that? Just sort of lost and, and a little incoherent. And uh, although we were conversing, and um, and I did ask him questions, and he did answer me, I did I did feel though that he was, you know, not well at all. Did you think he was well enough to rehearse? No. So as they say, the show must go on. So he rehearsed right up until the day he died. <laughs> Can you read me out loud what you wrote to Michael Roth on August 18th, 2009 at 724? I wonder why now I think I know what MJ died of and this would exonerate Conrad. Conrad Murray. Correct. Uh, what did you know would exonerate Conrad Murray? I don't remember. No recollection at all? No. Was anybody, did anybody ever ask you what you knew that would exonerate Conrad Murray? No. Did you ever tell the police that you had information that would exonerate Conrad Murray? No. Did you ever tell the LA uh, district attorney what information you had that would exonerate Conrad Murray? No. Did you ever tell his attorney what information, Murray's attorney, what information you had that would exonerate Conrad Murray? No. Dr. Murray had no control over this situation because what was happening in the background he was just a little fish in a big, dirty pond. What I know today, Michael would not have been able to complete the shows. MJ will also have a fan there, right there in the center. I'm trying to hear you say it again. There'll be a fan right there at the, uh, off the stage for you. Boom, right there. Michael was too weak, too, too emaciated, lack of energy.
for the Jackson family tried hard to convince the jury that AEG was responsible for Michael's death. The jury didn't buy it. That said, there is plenty of blame to go around here with doctors and drugs and pharmacies. To lay all the blame on Conrad Murray seems unfair. We're, we're not in Investigating the doctors, we're investigating Mr. Michael Jackson's death. We knew that there were multiple doctors doing what Dr. Murray had done, and that they had done it over the course of years. We decided to concentrate on that night for the criminal side of it, and so that negated all of the other history with the other doctors. Dr. Murray had no control over the situation because what was happening in the background it was just a little fish in a big, dirty pond. I really do believe that this death was inevitable. Whether it was Dr. Murray or the next doctor, he was lucky it hadn't happened before because Michael was going to get what he wanted. And if you said no, he would find somebody who would do it for him. I do agree that Murray was the one who ended up taking all the responsibility for Mr. Jackson's death. I don't think it's right, but you know what's right and what can be proven are two completely different things. There were a lot of people who should have been held responsible. The medical community is in great part responsible for Michael's death. It was just terrible medical care. Here's how deep it goes. Even doctors who were asked to testify in Dr. Murray's trial about the dangers of giving someone propofol every night for months, they ran for the hills. When I was trying to find doctors to evaluate the care that Dr. Murray had provided, a lot, most doctors told me no. They didn't want anything to do with it because they were worried about when malpractice becomes criminal conduct and setting a precedent. I contacted 53 different doctors trying to find experts to review Dr. Murray's level of care. And 10 of them said that they would do it. Everybody else said, no, I want no part of it. There's one issue that got lost during Dr. Murray's trial. The doctor told cops that he was actually trying to wean Michael off of propofol three days before he died. And on that fateful day, Murray says he walked out of the room and when he was gone, Michael took matters into his own hands. I successfully weaned him off of that agent up to three days prior to him passing. He was off for before. He had his own stash at home. It was in a red and white sports bag. He knew how to use propofol. He said he, doctors allow him to put it in, push it before, in my absence. I believe Michael Jackson got a hold of propofol and he slammed it into his system. And if you slam propofol into your body, you're gonna have cardiopulmonary arrest. It would support the fact that they did not find propofol in his brain. There was not enough time for it to get there. Michael, how are you, Michael? You're looking great, man. Thank you. The fact is, Michael Jackson is not the only celebrity to die at the hands of doctors who were more than accommodating when it came to pumping them full of drugs. The uh, number one cause of unnatural deaths in the United States of America this year was prescription drug overdoses. Some of the people who are complicit in uh, that scourge that is killing people like Michael Jackson and thousands of others are people like Dr. Conrad Murray, the so-called Dr. Feelgood doctors. It's pathetic that uh, a number of celebrities have passed away with doctors turning their heads and just writing prescriptions and giving their patients whatever they want, whenever they want. Being at the coroner's office for 17 years, I had a number of celebrities that did die, a number of them that died due to uh, over-medication.
I've been harmed. I've been hurt. I've taken a lot of blame that was not right. But regardless of what I've gone through, Michael's death was not the result of one fatal incident. It was more like a case of death by a thousand cuts. Who really killed Michael Jackson? In my opinion, Michael Jackson is ultimately responsible. I think he had uh, willing accomplices along the way, but you have to hold Michael accountable. He seduced these people. Who really killed Michael Jackson? I, I would say that Dr. Murray was a facilitator and Dr. Klein and a number of the other doctors that were in a hurry to give Michael what he wanted. The family couldn't stop it. They were concerned. AEG, according to the family, put a lot of pressure on Michael and no matter what anybody says, there gets a point where you could take a whole group of people and say that was the basic cause. Who really killed Michael Jackson? It's a lot more complicated than just Dr. Murray was at his bedside when he died. Circumstances had been leading up to this death for years. And all of these different medical professionals that allowed Michael to dictate his own terms get the medicines he wanted, when he wanted them, how he wanted them, where he wanted them. All of them are the reason why he's dead today. Who really killed Michael Jackson? In my opinion, it's my profession. It was not just one physician, it was multiple physicians. And I'm here to tell you that in those decades, my peers killed my patients, often celebrities all the time. And it, it breaks my heart to say it, but it's the truth. Who really killed Michael Jackson? It's sad to say that Michael Jackson died. But Michael Jackson killed Michael Jackson. And all of those other doctors that enabled him with opioids over the years are complicit to his death. I will always miss Michael. I've had a tough time. I've, I've been punished. I've been harmed. I've been hurt. I've taken a lot of blame that was not right. But regardless of what I've gone through, To the outside world, Michael was a genius with unchallenged ability. To the people who we're lucky enough to know him personally. He was caring and funny, honest, pure, non-jaded, and he was a lover of life.
At 50, from years of abuse at the hands of many doctors who got him addicted to drugs and then fueled that addiction. In the five decades of his life, he made enormous contributions to music and pop culture. Contributions highlighted during his memorial. Michael, when you left us, a part of me went with you, and a part of you will live forever within all of us. I would treasure the good times, the fun we had, singing, dancing, laughing. From the first beat of Billie Jean and the toss of that hat, I was mesmerized. But when he did his iconic moonwalk, it was magic. He let me know that as an African-American, you could travel the world. There was a world outside of America. He allowed Kobe and I to have our jerseys in people's homes across the world because he was already there. And he opened all those doors for us. To the outside world, Michael was a genius with unchallenged ability. To the people who were lucky enough to know him personally, he was caring and funny, honest, pure, non-jaded, and he was a lover of life. Few are chosen from amongst us to use their gifts and talents in an effort to bring the world together in true sister and brotherhood. Michael was such a one. If he was burned, he built a burn unit. If a hospital needed beds, he built old beds. Michael never stopped giving. I'm glad I live in an era when I got a chance to see the greatest entertainer of all time. I'm glad that I live in this era. He was the consummate student. He studied the greats and became greater. He raised the bar and then broke the bar. I think he is simply the greatest entertainer that ever lived. We know you're the Green Hawk. Everyone knows. What? <laughs> it's bananas. You're still wearing your mask, dude. If you have a secret identity, you need to keep it secret. And if you want to save by bundling home and car insurance, you need Geico. I'm not the Green Hawk. Uh, delivery for the Green Hawk? See how much you could save by bundling with Geico. Green. I will bring it to him. Everything we built is being blackmailed. Monarch is our music dynasty. Now and forever. I need you to do what has to be done. I'll do anything to protect this family. Monarch. Series premiere tonight on Fox. A stunning verdict in one of the most gripping trials in decades. As against Amber Heard, we the jury award compensatory damages in the amount of $10 million. A mammoth win for Johnny Depp. The smallest of victories for Amber Heard. As against John C. Depp II, we, the jury, award compensatory damages of $2 million. A nasty six-week-long trial filled with brutal allegations. She's a need for conflict. She's a need for violence. Nothing I did made him stop hitting me. Sordid details. On my side of the bed was human fecal matter. The biggest courtroom spectacle since OJ. It turned the internet on its head. A megabyte. Will Hollywood embrace Johnny again? And what about Amber? How romance... I was marrying the love of my life. ...turned into revenge. What? Such a baby! Oh, the f Oh, Johnny! You said, I will her burnt corpse afterwards to make sure she is dead. Did I read that right? You 
certainly do. Tonight, TMZ presents Johnny versus Amber from love to hate.